Um, we're excited to have the OECD team who did the 2020 economic survey for South Korea um, with COVID-19 clearly taking and changing how everyone's economy is functioning with uh, different restrictions in place, uh, trade slowing. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity to sort of take a good look, see where the South Korean economy is, see how COVID is impacting the South Korean economy, perhaps compared to some other economies, and also look at some of the longer term challenges South Korea faces in terms of its own economic performance. Um, with that, um, we're also happy to have Randall Jones, who uh, was previously the head of the Korea and Japan desk at the OECD and for many years put together these surveys on uh, South Korea's economy. And so with that, uh, Randall, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And thanks to KEI for organizing this uh, seminar. I'm delighted to see my former colleagues in Paris, Vincent Kuhn, who is uh, head of Country Studies 3 in Economics Department. So he covers Japan and Korea and a number of other countries. Uh, Christophe André, who's head of the Korea Sweden desk in the Economics Department and has completed his first survey, oh, many more to come. And uh, Jiwon Bum, who is, comes to us from Ministry of Economy and Finance, is now part of the OECD and, and helping. And Mathilde Pak, who is also part of the team. So we're delighted to have a chance to talk about the survey. Congratulations on an excellent survey. And uh, for the audience, we'll have a, first of all, a presentation of the survey, and then we'll all raise a few questions. And we'll have plenty of time afterwards for questions from the floor. So if you do have questions, please use the Q&A button and I'll try to uh, spot the questions and, and pass them on. So the time is uh, for the OECD team to uh, present the survey, please. Uh, good afternoon. We are delighted to take part uh, in this event. I will uh, just uh, uh, put up uh, the slides. Hopefully you can see, yes. Um, so uh, thanks very much for K to KEI for hosting uh, this, uh, this event with us. The, the report is still relatively fresh. Uh, it was uh, discussed by the committee uh, uh, in a Zoom session in June and then published uh, in August. And uh, we stand by uh, almost everything that is uh, in there. It's still uh, current. Uh, as you can see, the release uh, was itself a, a Zoom event uh, with uh, people in uh, the press uh, conference in, in, uh, room in Sejong listening in. Uh, and uh, the report underlies uh, how well Korea has done uh, in handling and is, is continuing to do in handling uh, the, the crisis. Um, one thing that really strikes us sitting in Europe uh, and probably strikes many people in the US as well is how uh, quickly uh, and thoroughly the authorities have reacted and they've remained very vigilant. Um, including uh, lately uh, for the Chosuk holidays, uh, now for the forthcoming holiday as well. Uh, there's no hint of complacency, and this is really a contrast with uh, the, the more relaxed, overly relaxed attitudes uh, uh, over the summer in Europe, uh, which have resulted in uh, a second wave basically in many countries here. Uh, the headlines covering the survey have focused very much on our growth projection. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, we, on the cover of the survey, we rewarded Korea with, with the slogan, uh, cheer up Korea, because Korea is doing so much better than indeed than uh, any other OECD country. So it's having a, a good crisis uh, with uh, what we projected at the time would be a 0.8% recession. Now we've revised this to minus 1.0 recession. I mean, it's still a tiny contraction compared to what we're seeing uh, in most European countries uh, and around the world. Uh, but uh, uh, th this focus on the, the, the short run performance is in our view a bit misguided. Uh, it makes for good headlines, but the, the main, the, the core of the report is about the longer term uh, challenges uh, Korea is facing, was facing before COVID and will face uh, even more so uh, uh, henceforth. And uh, one, one area is the labor market and the world of work, which is changing with, with the COVID crisis. The other uh, is uh, digitalization, uh, where Korea in some ways is a front runner, but in other ways uh, exhibits big gaps. So uh, we'll have uh, Jin Wan and Mathilde to talk respectively about these two aspects. But first, uh, I pass it on to Christophe André, the head of the uh, uh, Korea desk and Randall's uh, valiant successor. Uh, in this uh, position 
to uh, talk about the overall uh, picture for, for Korea. Christophe? Um, the key messages of the, of the survey is that uh, this crisis is not, is not finished. So uh, the government uh, needs to continue to support the economy, to support households and to support businesses until the, the economy is, uh, is uh, clearly re recovering. And uh, monetary policy should remain accommodative and also the uh, public investments that we find in the Korean New Deal, uh, they can uh, uh, enhance growth uh, in the longer term, uh, raise the, the growth potential uh, and, uh, and uh, help boost uh, the, the economy. Uh, workers uh, will need to be supported even if uh, after this crisis because a lot of jobs are being destroyed and some will not come back in the same sectors. You have sectors that, are, that require a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. They will not come back quickly. Also jo jobs related to travel, uh, to entertainment, etc. Uh, so there will be a need to reskill people to allow them to, to uh, find a better place in the, in the labor market. And uh, as Korea's population is aging, uh, it's uh, really important to try to lift labor participation and especially for the, the, the categories that uh, have low participation for the moment, like uh, in particular women, uh, young people who are uh, deeply affected by the, by the crisis. And uh, also in terms of older workers, the older workers have a high employment rate, but it's also important that uh, the quality of their jobs is improved. We are also in a time where a lot of things are changing, especially on technology. And uh, it's important that the regulation is adapted to this and that uh, competition is enhanced and uh, that uh, innovation is possible, especially for, for young firms. And uh, digitalization is, of course, uh, an important way to lift productivity. And uh, Mathilde is going uh, to uh, speak about this uh, afterwards. Uh, turning to the next slide, uh, the Korean recession is, uh, is relatively mild. Uh, as Vincent said, uh, we expect a, a contraction of about 1% in GDP this year. And this compares to uh, a downturn of about 4.5% for the, the world economy. In terms of employment, we also see that Korea is performing fairly well. Of course, a 1% drop in employment is significant, but compared to other countries, it's rather better. It's pretty similar to Japan, uh, also pretty similar to Germany, but in Germany and in other European countries, they have used a lot of uh, part-time uh, work schemes where uh, people work part-time or sometimes don't work at all and a large part of their salary is paid by the government. In countries that don't have this sort of schemes like Canada and the United States, we have seen uh, a much uh, larger drop in, uh, in employment. Uh, turning to the next slide, um, Vincent mentioned already that, um, that uh, Korea has really been able to cope very efficiently with the outbreak of the virus uh, compared to other countries. We didn't have full lockdowns in, in Korea. And uh, you see this in this indicator, which is from Google, which measures mobility for retail and recreation. And you see that at the low point in spring, uh, uh, mobility in Korea decreased by 40% compared to a normal level. Uh, in uh, countries like the UK, France, or Italy, we were closer to 90%. Uh, so the impact uh, on the economy was, uh, was smaller. And uh, by mid-July, we were back almost to uh, a normal level. Uh, we have seen in September uh, a bit of a fallback uh, because of the, of the new outbreak of the virus we saw in, uh, in Seoul. Uh, but uh, uh, still activity is a bit, uh, is a bit stronger uh, than, uh, than in many other countries. Uh, turning to the next slide, um, it is really important to note that uh, uh, workers have been affected very differently uh, across categories. And uh, with the dual labor market you have in Korea, uh, the temporary workers, the self-employed are much more 
uh, affected than, uh, than other employees. And many of them are working in, uh, in uh, wholesale and retail trade, in accommodation, in food, in activities that have been really hit by uh, the, the crisis. And uh, so you see the decline uh, in the employment of all these non-regular workers that is very important. And that's of course a big issue. And uh, that's also why the government uh, has uh, taken some measures to help these people, including through the fourth supplementary budget that uh, came out after the, the release of our survey and after the second outbreak of uh, uh, the, the virus. Uh, the next slide uh, uh, shows that uh, Korea has been able to respond strongly to the economic downturn because it has some fiscal space. Um, the number uh, uh, I put in uh, for 2020 is not an official forecast, it's just a crude estimate, uh, but uh, uh, we should have a deficit of around 4% uh, of, of GDP in the, in the budget uh, this year. Uh, and so this is, uh, uh, we are coming from about uh, nearly 1% of surplus. So this is uh, a five points uh, uh, deterioration in the fiscal balance, and so it helps the economy. And Korea can afford it because uh, it has low debt. It started this crisis with uh, government debt below 40%. And of course, it's increasing, uh, and there are long-term issues, but it's necessary to have a stimulus now. And it's also welcome that the government has now announced some fiscal rules so that uh, there is a clear vision of where Korea is, uh, is going in the, in the longer term, especially as the population is aging. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you see basically the, the big challenges we, we try to, to address, the long-term challenges we try to address in the, in the survey. Uh, growth is, uh, is projected to, to go down in the coming uh, decades in, in Korea because of population aging and uh, basically, um, to respond to this, it's necessary to mobilize labor resources to increase the employment rate. And you see that in Korea, the employment rate is below the OECD average. This is largely due to the uh, low activity of women, even though women in Korea are generally very highly qualified, a lot with tertiary education. So this is a waste of resources and uh, this needs to be improved. Uh, for young people also, uh, more opportunities will be needed. They are also affected by the crisis, the COVID crisis. And labor productivity is uh, also below the OECD average with great differences between uh, big firms and SMEs, between industry and services. So there are vast areas of the economy where uh, productivity can be, can be raised. Um, turning to the next slide, um, we have a few uh, key recommendations to mitigate uh, the impact of the, of the crisis. So the first one is really to continue supporting the, the economy. The support could be a bit more targeted. Actually, uh, since uh, we published this survey, there was the fourth uh, supplementary budget, which is a bit more targeted than uh, the previous support we had uh, in, in spring. So this is going in the right direction. Uh, also, we pointed out that fiscal plans to preserve long-term fiscal sustainability are necessary. And also there, the government, as I said before, has announced plan for fiscal rules, which uh, are, are also welcome. Then uh, the Korean New Deal is going to play an important role in uh, boosting investment uh, in uh, technology and uh, 5G, artificial intelligence. Uh, I think these are very important uh, to, to create the economy of the future. Of course, some cost benefit analysis of these investment is, is very important because it's sometimes, you know, when you want to spend uh, uh, to boost the economy, it's, uh, a, 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 you do it quickly. And, uh, and uh, what you really want to do is to also have a long-term impact beyond the immediate demand impact. You want to have a long-term supply impact on the economy and that also will have fiscal sustainability. Uh, monetary policy needs to remain accommodative uh, in case there would be a, a, a deterioration of the situation, maybe unconventional measures could be uh, considered. So the Bank of Korea uh, should be ready, but actually for the moment, the situation doesn't seem to, to justify this. And the next slide uh, 
uh, is uh, about uh, about aging. So then I'm going to to leave the floor to to Jean Wan, who will continue on this on these issues. Nice to meet you. My name is Jin Anbang. I am presenting on the aging issues in South Korea. First of all, I will explain the main characteristics of the Korean labor market. After that, I'll explain some implications and recommendations. Korea is the fastest aging population. Korea's birth rate, rate has fallen around one, the lowest level in OECD. Aging is more acute challenge than any other country. As you can see, the old age dependency ratio is expected to become the top of the OECD from current 20% to more than 80% in 2060. This rapid aging trend would cause low economic growth, generate risks of inequality, and increase public debt sharply. Meanwhile, aging can also provide opportunities for businesses producing goods and services demanded by older generation. Uh, secondly, uh, disadvantaged groups uh, face larger employment gaps compared to the employment age, employment rate of prime, prime age male. In 2016, the employment gap of disadvantaged group is around 32%. That is much higher than the OECD average among these groups, the employment gap are particularly larger for young people and mother with young children and people with disabilities. Job quality is also problematic, especially compared to the OECD, many workers on low wages and work very long hours. In the left hand side, Korea's low salary incidence in red bar is above the OECD average in green bar. In the right hand side, Korean workers for all age groups also work much longer hours than the OECD average. Particularly, older workers work much longer hours. This reflects weak social pensions and social, and also it shows skill shortages and on labor market rigidity. The, the government has made effort to reduce the long working hours. In 2018, the total maximum, maximum weekly working hours has been reduced from 68 to 52 hours in the companies with more than 50 employees. Another feature of the Korean labor market is the widest gender wage gap. The women's employment in Korea is relatively low, especially past age 30. Many women uh, quit their job when they have children or raise their children. After the childbirth and child care, many women re-enter the labor market as non-regular workers with a low salary. This is a major cause for the wider gender wage gaps. As you can see the red bar on the right side, the country's gender wage gap is around 34% which is almost three times more than the OECD average. The elderly, the elderly are very poor, especially the Korea has the highest share of the people in relative poverty. Meanwhile, the relative poverty rate in other populations is similar, similar or slightly higher than the OECD average. The National Pension Scheme, introduced in 1988, became universal in just 1999. Accordingly, the current replacement ratio of the National Pension Scheme is very low at around 40% compared to the OECD average of 60%. Another weakness is that many old workers in non-negative jobs are excluded from social insurance scheme. The coverage of the national pension scheme for non-regular workers was only about 36%. Expanding the coverage of the national pension scheme to the non-regular workers is another challenge to South Korea. Compared to OECD countries, Korea's youth unemployment is very low. This reflects 
long studies, especially labor market duality. And especially uh, the young people extend the education, education period in the hope of securing decent job in the public sector or large companies. It is often believed that old workers, early retirement could create job opportunities for young people. However, as you can see the slide, there is a rather a positive relationship between the youth employment and the elderly people's employment. This positive correlation means two generations tend to be complements, not substitutes, because youth workers and old workers have different skills and different experiences. Last, uh, next two slides are summary and key recommendations for raising employment and enhanced job quality. Uh, Korea should pro, uh, strengthen protection for non regular workers, such as uh, platform workers, to withstand the possible future pandemic impacts. Social insurance scheme needed to extend it with more effective enforcement. Second, uh, Korea has a focus on more direct job creation rather than public employment service. Korea needs to allocate more resources and money for the public employment service and training programs as well. Korea has no official cash sequence benefit right now. Korea needs to support rehabilitation and their return to work. Korea should prepare the introduction of cash sequence benefit as planned in the New Deal project. Korea also should ensure that workers stay longer in their career jobs. So Korea also needed to increase inclusiveness. For this, Korea should increase the basic pension further to help the elderly people in absolute poverty. Korea also needed to phase out the family support obligation from the basic livelihood security programs. As I explained previously, Korea should reduce the gender wage gap and more transparent information on salary difference could help to mitigate and address gender inequality. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon from Paris. Um, so when it comes to emerging digital technologies, Korea is a top player. It has an outstanding digital infrastructure, very dynamic ICT sector, and it was the first country to introduce nationwide 5G. And this has spurred many projects to enhance competitiveness, innovation, and the quality of life, like smart factories, smart grids, smart healthcare, smart cities, smart roads, just to name a few. And on top of that, Korea has been praised for its swift and efficient use of advanced digital tools to contain COVID-19 without shutting down the economy. So you have AI to, for fast testing or mobile apps like the Corona Map apps that you can see here on this slide to, to know where are the confirmed cases of COVID-19 or remote services like deliveries by these very cute uh, robots to limit the spread of the virus. So as you can see, digital technologies offer opportunities to raise firms' productivity as well as the population well-being. But Korea economy-wide productivity is far below the OECD average. It's one of the lowest because low productivity sectors like trade, accommodation, catering, which are in this graph hidden in the other business services, account for a high share of employment compared to the OECD average. And most jobs created in new SMEs are created in these low productivity sectors. And even in high productivity sectors like manufacturing, 
SMEs are less productive than large firms. So there you have productivity gaps between manufacturing and between services and between SMEs and large firms. And all those weigh on the economy-wide productivity. These productivity gaps between SMEs and large firms are also reflected in digital gaps. Of course, there is digital gaps between SMEs and large firms in other OECD countries, but the gap is higher in Korea because SME face, face obstacles to, to the adoption of advanced technologies like cloud computing or big data because of a lack of information, of innovation, a lack of information and funds, a lack of skilled workers and low access to training. There is also a digital gap between generation, which is the highest among OECD countries. As you can see on this graph, the share of young adults with limited or no digital skills is the lowest among OECD countries. But when you, you compare with older generations, almost all of them have limited or no digital skills. So older generations often lack digital as well as basic skills to participate in diversified and sophisticated online activities like online banking, online learning, and online purchasing. And in an aging and increasingly digitalized society, that is a problem because it exacerbates well-being inequality as part of the population is left behind. Now, another issue is the regulations, which so regulation for product and service market, which are st still st stringent in Korea, as you can see on this graph. So the red bars represent Korea and the green squares, the OECD average. And these stringent regulations, they hold back innovation and new business models, as well as competition and productivity growth. Now, Korea introduced regulatory sandboxes to tackle this issue and to allow firms in new technologies and new industries to test on a temporary base their product and business models without being subject to all existing legal requirement. An example of, of this regulatory sandbox is the temporary, temporary lifting of the ban on telemedicine during the COVID-19 outbreak which illustrates the potential benefits of a timely review of regulations. Now for our key recommendations, our survey highlights this recommendation focusing on three main areas. So first, the regulations. So it's all about using regulatory sandboxes to identify excessive regulation and revise or abolish it. And for the telemedicine, it's, we encourage uh, Korea to facilitate it as long as it is compatible with preserving patient safety and quality of care. The second area is the subsidies to SMEs, which should focus more on promoting growth and boosting innovation productivity. And some solutions include providing SMEs in manufacturing as well as in services with innovation vouchers that can be used to commission R&D studies and on potential for new technology introduction, as well as help developing innovation network, which are limited in Korea. And the third is about the skills. So it's all about providing more basic ICT courses to SME employees and older workers, as well as reduce training costs for SMEs and provide targeted adult learning programs to SME managers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that presentation. It was very interesting. I'd like to just start off perhaps by looking at the short-term outlook. Um, your forecast you made in June has held up very well. Uh, 0 0.8, negative 0 0.8, and you're still around that. 
Uh, in June, you forecast that this quarter, the fourth quarter, would have growth of 8.2% annualized. You think that's still um, realistic given the um, sorts of negative trends? For example, consumer confidence, I think, in September fell fairly sharply. And now we have the two weeks of um, tighter restrictions to try to limit the spread of COVID. I guess on the positive side, exports have seem to have uh, rebounded a bit, at least on a year on year basis. So what do you think about the fourth quarter? Will we see another strong quarter or we see somewhat of a stall given uh, concerns about a resurgence of the, of the virus? Well, for the moment, we have our 1%, uh, minus 1% forecast. We, we have a quarter on quarter, an increase of 1.8 in the third quarter and 1.5 in the fourth quarter. Uh, well, the third quarter, you have two conflicting uh, impacts. Uh, consumption has been uh, held back a bit by the, the new outburst of the, of the virus. But uh, exports have surprised on the on the high side with very strong and, and broad based numbers, which is important for the for the future. Um, so we, we think this is this is going to be to be possible. There is uh, also the the, the fourth uh, uh, supplementary budget that is going to to support the economy. So so we are confident uh, uh, Korea can achieve this performance. Uh, of course, there is a lot of uncertainty. So the first uncertainty is about new outbreaks of the, the virus in Korea, even if they are controlled fairly well, they have an impact on the economy. And the second, which perhaps worries me a bit more, is the outbreaks in other parts of the world, which might affect Korean exports. And uh, there are still questions about that. But, uh, you know, unless you, you have a big... Uh, a new outburst of the virus. I think uh, Korea will grow at about minus one percent. There is a, an uncertainty margin, but we shouldn't be too far from this. In terms of fiscal policy, that's a, a hot topic right now in Korea. Uh, as you point out, the deficit has swung from a surplus on a general government basis down to about minus four. And as you also point out, debt, government debt, is still relatively low though it has surpassed this magic 40% of GDP ratio that seemed to be quite important to uh, many people. So we saw new rules come out uh, just recently. Uh, in the 2016 survey, we recommended uh, spending rules and a target for the budget deficit. And it seems like the new rules have those plus a target of keeping government debt below 60% of GDP. But there seems to be a lot of criticism about the plan First of all, that it's not legally binding, uh, doesn't take effect until 2025. Uh, the government has such flexibility they can override or change the rules without uh, National Assembly approval. And the other thing that um, isn't clear to me, it seems like you have to keep one target, either deficit of 3% or debt below 60%. As long as you meet one of those targets, it's okay, which makes it rather, uh, rather a loose target. So I'd be interested in your views on what you think about this new fiscal plan and if it's enough to really ensure fiscal sustainability in the long run for Korea? Well, I would say, you know, the, the fact that it's not, not binding, I think the, the, the fiscal rules that work best that I know actually are, are fairly loose rules, but with government with very strong commitment and strong institutions. I'm thinking of Sweden, uh, also, also Denmark, also, also Australia. Uh, you know, these countries, they, they have basically rules, uh, at least for Sweden and Australia, that say, uh, well, we want uh, this objective over the business cycle, and it's not very well precised what the business cycle is. So, so you would think, well, these rules are very loose. But actually, they help these countries uh, because they have strong commitment. Uh, to have very efficient uh, fiscal policy, counter-cyclical policy. I think with strict rules, you, you, you have one, one problem, which actually with quite similar rules that, to what is proposed in Korea, in, in Europe, you know. In, in Europe, you had a lot of, of government that were saying, uh, well, okay, the limit is 3%. So in very good times, they are 2.8. And... Uh, <laughs> Then, uh, you know, in the, the, when there is a crisis, they, they get uh, below 3%, and that's, that's the risk. 
And uh, if you see, if you say, okay, we, we aim at three percent, and uh, and uh, if the situation is worse, we we will go further than that. I think you you might get in trouble. So I think it's really important to think, okay. 3% should be what you should aim at when the situation is relatively bad. And otherwise, you know, have something like um, closer to maybe maybe still a deficit, but but not not further than 1% or something like that. So you, you need to keep some margin. But again, commitment is, is very important. And uh, yes, and 3% and 60% of, uh, of debt is, uh, is a sort of, uh, well, Depending on the assumption you make for the growth rate and the inflation rates, that's uh, that's uh, almost equivalent. In terms of uh, monetary policy, um, it seemed like Korea was flirting with deflation. In the uh, second quarter, we had negative 0.1% year on year, and it's bounced back in the third quarter. But uh, S and P, for example, called deflation a major threat for Korea. I wonder how serious you think a threat deflation really is, and if so, uh, what should the government do about it or the Bank of Korea do about it to try to avoid this trap, which as we know from Japan is, is very difficult to get out of once you fall into it? Well, you know, first I think minus point one is not deflation. I mean, uh, you know, deflation is a sustained fall in the level of prices. Uh, uh, you know, if you're close to zero as we, as we are now, uh, with a, a, a few uh, volatile items, you can get to a negative number, and then in the next month you get a positive number. This is this is not really deflation. Uh, that's that's the first point. Uh, the second point, which is which is really important, I think, is that uh, uh, in history, basically, except if you take a period in the 19th century under a, a different monetary regime, you have two big episodes. Of, uh, of deflation. The first one is the Great Depression, uh, particularly in the US, and the second is in Japan. And uh, what's the, the common point between these, these two episodes? Uh, before the episode, you had a, a, a bigger rise in asset prices, in stock prices, in uh, uh, real estate prices, property prices, land prices, and uh, then you got a collapse and the banking sector was heavily exposed. And then uh, the policies at that time, both in the US during the Great Depression and in Japan, failed to restructure the uh, financial system. So you had a dysfunctional financial system, and this is what caused uh, deflation. So that's the two deflation episodes we have in, in, in history. I think the situation is not the same for, for Korea now. You don't have these, these imbalances. Uh, I would say in as, on asset prices, I would say if there are imbalances, they are at the world level. If, if everyone is in the same boat and uh, we can be worried about that, but that's not a specific issue for Korea. So for the moment, I'm not, I'm not really worried about deflation in Korea. Well, I agree. And in Japan, uh, many people, especially the Bank of Japan, blame falling population as a key cause of deflation. And Korea will have that in about seven or eight years. But uh, I think good policy can uh, overcome that. We had a question actually from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Im Won Hyuk from KDI School, a good friend of ours. And he said, um, Korea government is considering a Maastricht-like fiscal rule using a target of debt to GDP of 60%. In theory, the most important driver of fiscal sustainability is real growth relative to real interest rate, not debt to GDP ratio. Would you, what would you recommend as a sensible fiscal rule for Korea in this age of low interest rates and Korea's status as a non-reserve currency country? Well, two, two remarks on this. First, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the interest rate and the growth rate, uh, you might conclude that uh, you can have whatever level of debt uh, that, uh, that is necessary because, uh, because the growth rate is likely to be higher than the interest rate in, in the coming years. So, so this, is, this is very dangerous. I mean, you, you still need to, to, to take into account that in the long term, interest rates should, should go up. And, uh, and so I think, you know, saying, well, just interest rates are low, so we can borrow as much as we can is, uh, is a bit of a dangerous view. Uh, the second thing about, uh, about the currency, I think uh, 
you know, the, the government debt is is in uh, is in local currency. We've seen over our recent years that we had actually capital flows uh, coming to Korea in uh, in difficult times. So Korea is more like a safe haven now. So of course it's not the dollar, but uh, it's still it's still a pretty strong currency. So I think there is room, and uh, I think um, uh, Korea can afford to have the same type of rules as uh, all uh, other advanced uh, OECD economies. So 60%, 3%, 3%. Um, you know, I don't think this is this is really a, this is really an issue. I think this is uh, this is a good uh, a, a good rule. Okay. Uh, one of the key concerns that uh, I know Christoph is an expert on housing. In Korea, uh, one of the top concerns is that housing prices in Seoul, uh, the metropolitan area, but especially in Gangnam, have been rising quite a bit during the past three years. And also this means household debt has also been rising from a high level. And the government, of course, uh, is to announced 24 programs to try to stabilize housing prices without uh, much effect, I guess, thus far. Uh, the Bank of Korea has interest rates at a historical low is they try to support the economy during this pandemic. So how do you think, um, how can Bank of Korea and the government manage their targets of stabilizing housing prices and stabilizing household debt while maintaining a very, very relaxed uh, accommodative monetary policy? Are macro prudential rules gonna be enough to try to meet their goals in this regard? Well, that's a good question. I think macro prudential has been quite effective in Korea in, uh, in the past years. Uh, one thing I need to note also is that uh, in Korea, you have a, a, a big increase in uh, apartment prices in Seoul, but you, if you look at uh, house prices at the, uh, at the country level, they are, they are broadly flat. So, so it's different from many OECD countries where you have seen a very fast rising uh, house prices. Um, that said, there is a, uh, an important uh, an important issue uh, I think uh, I think it's going in the in the very low interest rate environment it's very difficult to to control house prices um, and there are trade-offs I mean you, you you could restrict credit you know you can restrict credit have very tough uh, macro prudential measures and that this will have an impact on prices but this will uh, also uh, uh, put all first buy, first time buyers out of the market. So 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 there are consequences. Uh, I think what is what is important is uh, to increase uh, supply. I think I think in Korea there is uh, and in Seoul there is a, an imbalance between supply and demand. And actually in the past, uh, uh, you know, Korea stand, stand out stands out because. Uh, in many OECD countries, you had very rigid supply and you had increasing demand because of financial liberalization, because of lower interest rates and prices uh, went up a lot. Uh, in Korea, in the early 90s, there was a lot of construction and uh, this stabilized prices for a very long time. So, so Korea has been able to do this in the past and uh, I've, the government has now, I think after a few years where they were more looking at measures towards speculation and things like that, they are more looking at supply again. And I think I really welcome this. Right. I know my frustration in the past was there's more emphasis on pushing down demand and increasing supply. And I think now we see a, a better uh, approach uh, by this government. Why don't we switch to the labor market? We have a question from Mr. Neil Lunt. He asked, which labor market groups have been particularly disadvantaged by COVID? Are they simply a reflection of previous trends or have there been fast fallers? Yeah, first, uh, the, the, as I show, explained about the slide, the slide shows the past trend until 2018. But as you newly mentioned, the COVID-19 could have COVID-19 have impacted the disadvantaged groups, especially on uh, women, youth, young, young, young workers, and mothers with young children, and especially with people with disabilities, showing in the slide, and. 
And therefore, government also uh, for example, the total employment uh, also declined by uh, more than one percent on year on year in a vast uh, temporary workers and daily workers also lost uh, their job uh, six, more than six uh, percent. I mean that uh, the COVID-19 affected the uh, non-regular workers and especially in terms of uh, gurus, the youth and mothers with uh, young children and uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, were uh, affected seriously. Thank you. If you stress the importance of increasing female employment, and I agree that's uh, very important. Um, Japan, Japan's case is going back to my other country. Um, the female employment rate jumped from 60% in 2012 up to 70% because of labor shortages. And I think that's going to happen in Korea as the working population is falling. Labor shortages will bring women into the labor force. The problem is in Japan, more than half of these new jobs are non-regular jobs, meaning many are part-time and low-wage jobs. So I think the fear in Korea is that uh, demographics will bring women into labor force that will prevent them from getting good re uh, regular jobs and getting leadership positions. And already in Korea, 41% uh, of women are non-regular workers. And uh, in Japan, that share has gone up as well as women are hired to, uh, to make up for the falling demand. So I, I wonder if the government, what is their plan to get rid of the labor market dualism that discourages especially women with education from going into the labor force. Okay, so, um, well, there, there are a number of measures that, that have already been taken and that are going uh, in the right direction. We are talking, for example, uh, about measures to, to improve uh, work-life balance, uh, measures to improve childcare, uh, measures to create job centers for women. Uh, so, so a number of, of measures that are going in the, in the right direction. Uh, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult issue, uh, but, and it will take time. I think that's, that's the, the main thing. And this crisis doesn't help because uh, of course you, you mentioned the, the labor shortage, but demand for labor will be also a bit lower in the coming years. So it doesn't, it doesn't help. Uh, but there are measures going in the right direction. Uh, I think one issue is uh, also uh, about the wage structure because uh, because uh, women are, are you know the wage gap we, we've shown the wage gap and it's very it's very high so 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 for a lot of very highly educated women it's uh, it's not very rewarding to to join the, the labor market so 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 you you need to to really create create better, uh, opportunities, and I think I, I think that's that's part also of a of a cultural change, and uh, you know it will probably help also if uh, if growth is in employment is less concentrated in the big companies. I mean uh, I mean you, you for the moment you have a dual system, but the big companies and the public sector, and then the the, the small companies which are generally providing. Uh, pretty low quality jobs for many of them. And uh, so, so, you know, if you, you manage to create more possibility, more growth companies, more dynamic companies uh, in, the, in the SME sector, in the upper part of the SME sector, that could help women, women too. Uh, but this is a long process. There was a question asking for clarification on the gender wage gap. Does it uh, adjust or control for differences in seniority occupation, or is it just the raw gender gap between men and women? No, it's just so. So, so it's just it. It's just uh, the gender gap between between men and women. You you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's just, just between. It's just between men and women, but it gives me the opportunity to, to, to say something about this because actually in Sweden, uh, they have a report that they publish every year where they break down the wage gap 
explaining all the differences. What is due to part-time? What is due to seniority? What is due to, to the type of industry, uh, etc. It's a very comprehensive report. They have been publishing every year for uh, a number of years. Uh, and I think Korea should do the same because it's it's very useful, you know, to to ori to orient policies and including in companies, you know, to to uh, to to orient the, the wage setting, saying okay, you have lower wages, maybe that's justified, but this part is not justified at all. And uh, uh, I think I, I think that's a, a, an example of good practice that that Korea should follow. I know there have been estimates of the gap adjusting for seniority, and of course, non-regular much lower, but they have short tenure by definition because many are fixed term contracts. So it's kind of a, um, unfair that they're condemned to having low wages because they have to change jobs so frequently. Uh, turning to the older worker issue, uh, you talked about the importance of more flexible wages so that older people don't leave their career job in their 50s. And I know the government's tried. We were, Vince and I were there in 20, 15, when the peak wage system uh, passed the National Assembly and there was a national strike against the peak wage system. So clearly the workers are not very excited about more wage flexibility. They like the steady increase the seniority. For Japan, uh, we recommended uh, getting rid of outlawing mandatory retirement because mandatory retirement is uh, what allows seniority-based wages to continue. Once workers' productivity falls below their wage, then companies don't want them to be there. So we recommended getting rid of, of uh, mandatory retirement. In Korea, the firms can set a mandatory retirement age of 60, which is very low given that life expectancy now is 82. So do you, are you in favor, I guess, of, of trying to raise the retirement age and perhaps one day get rid of it? Or is that uh, too, uh, too ambitious at this point? Uh, as I explained before, that there are a correlation between the youth employment and the older generation, older workers' employment. Uh, but the Korea has a, a, a two different features about the labor market. Because first one is uh, due to the seniority-based wage system, the cost of older workers may uh, exceed the, their productivity. And to increase increase mandatory uh, retirement age could have a negative effect on the young workers' employment. And secondly, since uh, the number of uh, high quality jobs in the public, for example, public sector jobs and the large companies uh, have been reduced sharply, the competition between uh, old workers and the young young generations are believed to be very high and fierce. Realistically, under, the, under this situation, uh, over the seniority-based wage system and weak social safety net, and, and the strong, stronger uh, protection for regular workers, it is not easy for the public to accept ab abolishing the mandatory retirement age right now. But the, the future direction is uh, the increasing the mandatory retirement age and the abolishing retirement mandatory age. And possibly to do so, the facilitating flexible labor market and enforcing social safety net are needed so as to increase the mandatory retirement age and abolish mandatory retirement age. Let's turn now to the um, last section on and digitalization. And uh, Ingwen Hyak Pak Sanim has a, a question on this as well. He says, um, the share of people with limited or no digital skills, is it based on opinion surveys or standard tests? It's rather odd to see a high figure for such people between 25 and 34. Um, are they being more modest in their subjective assessment of their digital skills than their counterparts in other countries? So the graph are based on data from the OECD adult survey on, uh, survey on adult skills, PIAC. Uh, so this is basically uh, standard tests and more precisely what we call digital skills are scores based on um, 
the proficiency of problem solving in uh, technology rich environments. So I don't know what the questions are, but those are the scores how these people scored. Now, that being said, I mean, this uh, survey, I mean, the data, they are either from 2012 or 2015, depending on the countries, because this is a really, really big survey. And they are doing new rounds. I think there's even now a second round for other countries, but not Korea. So perhaps in the more recent data, we'll see uh, the 25, 34 closer to the, to the younger, younger generation. I think we've we've run out of time. Uh, Troy sent me a message saying it's 11 a.m. So I, we could go on for a long time, but I think we'll have to stop here. But thank you very much and um, congratulations on your survey. I, I hope the government will uh, carefully implement your recommendations and uh, improve growth and inclusiveness in Korea. So thank you very much. And thanks again to Troy and, and to KEI.